Okay, I think I'll just start with my talk. My name is Deepak Uni. I work at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And the title of my talk is BioLink Model for Standardizing Knowledge Graphs and Making Them Interoperable. Graphs as a way of representing human knowledge in a computable form. This idea has been around for decades, and it originates from the research into artificial intelligence and the use of semantic networks. And at its simplest, a knowledge graph is a graph that represents knowledge, where nodes represent entities and edges represent relationships between these entities. The phrase knowledge graph can be used to collectively refer to graph-oriented databases um, that can be either property graphs or RDF triple stores. And knowledge graphs have gained popularity in recent years in both academic as well as commercial implementations. And um, I think it saw more resurgence in popularity when Google released their own Google Knowledge Graph a few years ago, which contains billions of facts uh, and power stuff like um, you know, Google Search and Google Assistant. But we are more interested in open source uh, tools and software. And so uh, some examples of open source knowledge graphs are uh, Wikidata and DBpedia, which are built using semantic web technologies. But they're also, into, uh, now I keep repeating the phrase knowledge graphs, and I'm just going to uh, have an acronym for that called KG, and that's what I'll be using for the remainder of the talk. So there are KGs in life sciences too. For example, the semantic midline database is a, a, a repository of semantic predications or statements extracted from PubMed citations. Then we have HetioNet, which is uh, pretty much a, a heterogeneous network uh, that contains information from millions of biomedical studies uh, developed as a part of a drug repurposing project by Daniel Himmelstein. And we have a biological subset for Wikidata, which contains uh, facts about genes, disease, chemical substances, proteins, all linked using semantic web technologies. Then we have the Monarch Initiative that has a knowledge graph that contains information about genes, disease, phenotype, genotype, linked uh, with associations with uh, evidence for these associations. And Bio2RDF is uh, an RDF triple store that, contains, that integrates uh, data from popular bioinformatics databases. And these are only a few of the examples that are out there being used in biomedical research. And there are some advantages to using knowledge graphs. Um, they provide a flexible way of representing heterogeneous uh, data and knowledge. The graph style of modeling or representation uh, makes it easy to decompose complex knowledge into simple facts or statements. KGs that have ontologies loaded in them uh, allow for deductive um, inferences through logical rules. This is where um, you have uh, something like a reasoner that goes through the nodes and edges in a knowledge graph and tries to infer new facts from existing ones. And this is, wh this is what makes knowledge graphs so powerful. And KGs can also be used for machine learning, where they are usually embedded into vector spaces and then used as input for neural networks. And um, projects like uh, knowledge graph embedding techniques uh, make use of this approach for um, knowledge graph completion. And KGs also serve as a store of information for various downstream APIs, portals, and applications. But there, there are some challenges with using KGs, or using more than one KGs. Not all KGs are built um, with the same goal in mind. Each KG is specifically developed for a particular task, and it can be difficult to use them in a context for which they weren't originally designed for. For example, one KG might be represented using a triple store, another might be represented using a property graph. And there are some inherent differences between these two type of representations. For example, in a triple store, you can attach properties to an edge, which can describe that edge further. But you cannot do that in a uh, triple store. And there are ways around this, like RDF reification. But then to do that, you would have to transform the entire graph, which can be a, a time-consuming process. And the vocabulary used for um, representing nodes and edges can be different between knowledge graphs. For example, and those differences can be either semantic or syntactic. Semantic being, you know, using different terms from an ontology to refer to different nodes in a graph, um, and syntactic being something as simple as an uppercase G for referring to a gene node and a lowercase G in, an, in another graph. And this can get in the way of, you know, writing scripts and tools that actually parse through these graphs. And KGs typically lack schema. This makes it easy to, well, the graph style of representation makes it easy for representing knowledge graphs, and um, hence you don't necessarily need to adhere to a schema that is good and bad. Um, some groups uh, that have KGs provide the schemas online, but they may or may not be machine readable, which then gets in the way. 
And the choice of identifiers used can also be different. Um, if I take the example of gene nodes in a knowledge graph, one KG might use NCPI gene namespace to, to uniquely refer to a gene. Another uh, graph might use a GNC identifiers, and yet another might not use either of them. They might just mint their own identifiers. And at the end of the day, these knowledge graphs are um, graph style of representation of uh, various sources that they, uh, that they pulled their knowledge from. And these sources may not originally be graph oriented. So there's a step of transforming these data sources into onto the, an implicit graph data model. And different groups may have different interpretation on how to do this. And because of this, integrating graphs together makes uh, uh, becomes a hard endeavor and you have to get in touch with each individual group and trying to get more information about these knowledge graphs. We certainly face this issue with, in, in case of the NCATS Biomedical Data Translator Project. Uh, and this project was, um, actually it's a project that's funded by the National Center for Advancing Translational Science at the NIH. And the goal was to build a general purpose inference engine that would integrate bi uh, clinical and biomedical data along with life science knowledge. And, um, which is capable of um, translating basic science findings into uh, clinical discoveries. So the idea was to have a system that would take questions from a researcher, like for example, give me novel Fanconi anemia therapeutic candidates, and then take this question, introspect the graph or the knowledge that's available, and then send back the response to the user. And we had different teams uh, or, uh, that had reasoning capabilities, which we will refer to as reasoner teams, uh, which had their own tools for reasoning or performing reasoning and their own knowledge graphs. And they have their own you know, uh, data sources of interest. But then the problem was, why not pull all these KGs together? And this would you know, increase the predictive powers or increase the reasoning capabilities of these uh, uh, reasoning tools. So, but that requires standardization across all these knowledge graphs. So and that brings us to the BioLink model. And this was developed as uh, a part of the standardization efforts uh, in the NCATS translator project. And this con the model itself consists of two um, uh, branches. One is the entity types, the other is the association types. The entity types refer to nodes in a graph, and they represent entities found in biological and biomedical knowledge, like genes, disease, um, protein, phenotypic feature. And this is a hierarchy in the model that shows uh, at the, the root of all uh, entity types is named thing. Which, which can be anything uh, in, a, in a, any node in a knowledge graph. And in this model, each entity type has its own unique stable URI, uh, mapping to other ontologies like SIO, sequence ontology, and even uh, and other ontologies in OBO, and a li list of valid ID prefixes that can be used to refer to nodes of these, uh, of these type. And these are, of course, higher level terms that can be used to categorize nodes in a KG. For more detailed typing, you can use specific terms from an ontology. And here's an example of um, a gene, uh, entity types gene in the model, where you have um, an alias, a class URI, and mapping to uh, sequence ontology, semantic science integrated ontology and wiki data, and some ID prefixes that you can use to refer uh, to this gene in a graph. And now association types, this is the other branch of the model. Uh, and they refer to edges. And the BioLink model itself is edge-centric, and it provides all possible associations that are possible, uh, that can be used. And the root of all association is the association class. And some examples are gene to gene association or gene to disease association. As you can see from the name, there is, an, each association has a subject and an object uh, that is being linked by this association. And that's what it's trying to uh, represent. It tries to connect a subject node and an object node via a relation property. The nature of this association depends upon uh, the, relation, the value that is in the relation property, which is typically uh, a term from the relations ontology. Now, certain associations can have, and of course, associations have properties like provided by evidence and publications that further explain or define that association. And certain associations can have additional properties that are unique to them. For example, a disease to phenotypic feature association might have frequency qualifier that defines the frequency with which that uh, phenotype was observed in a population of, with that disease. Now, the entirety of the model is defined in a YAML, which is considered to be the source of truth. We then use a BioLink ML, a package or a metamodeling framework that then parses this YAML to create the documentation, Python data classes, JSON schema, RDFL, and shape expressions. And these are all uh, artifacts that are being used actively by uh, our project. 
Now, this is a high-level overview of the model in uh, Translator. Uh, and as you can see, to explain this image, the user uh, flow goes from left to right, and the data flow goes from right to left. Here we have a researcher that is asking the question, and this question is being captured by these reasoner tools. And <laughs> right, so the question is being captured by these reasoner tools. And as I mentioned earlier, initially each reasoner had their own uh, data sources from which uh, they would uh, try to find an answer to, to this question. But then the idea of having an integrated knowledge graph was so that all possible information was available to these reasoners before they even started answering these questions that were being asked. In this approach, no single reasoner team is responsible for ingesting the entirety of data, uh, data corpus and biomedical knowledge, right? And the reasoner teams would then um, traverse through the graph, reason over the nodes and edges that are in this graph, and then find some answers, uh, and then send these answers back along with evidence. And, and these, each, each reasoner has their own uh, style of ranking and scoring these results, and then they're sent back to the user. Uh, and in general, this user is a subject matter expert who would then further analyze these results and um, check for accuracy. Right? So we have had four teams that have adopted the BioLink model in our project, but incidentally, these are the same teams who were involved in developing the model. So now we are in the process of working with other groups um, in, in the project in adopting this model and um, making sure it's, it's a painless process. right? And one thing to note here is that the model itself is technology agnostic. It can work with either property graphs or RDF triple stores. And this chart gives a high level overview of the different BioLink entity types in uh, each of these graphs that I showed in the previous table. Um, as you can see, some knowledge graphs can be highly diverse in the, uh, in the style of represent, in the type of entities that they represent, while as others not so much. But that completely depends on the data source that you're ingesting, and this can change um, when you change your data sources or add more data sources to your knowledge graph. Now, just to compare to existing projects, um, we have bioschemas. When comparing BioLink model to bioschemas, bioschemas is aimed at improving findability of data sets in life sciences. Uh, it is not essentially a data model for biological knowledge. Um, and when comparing to Intermine, Intermine has a core model that is backed by sequence ontology, and it, and it ha provides extension to the core model, which makes adoption easier. But then it is more comparing a relational data model versus a graph data model. And um, now comparing to OBO, OBO is a collection of ontologies, while BioLink model is a data model. BioLink model, it is not an ontology. I just want to make it clear. Uh, and we, but we do have mapping from different classes in BioLink model to uh, various ontologies in OBO, like semantic science integrated ontology or sequence ontology. Now, the BioLink model itself in isolation is not enough. We need a suite of tools that helps in its adoption and use. So as I mentioned earlier, we have BioLink ML, which is a meta-modeling framework for building the BioLink model. We have a BioLink model toolkit, which is a toolkit for working with the model and just exploring the data model. And the last but not the least is KGX, which is a knowledge graph exchange toolkit for reading, merging, building, and validating knowledge graphs. KGX also tries to validate uh, or check for BioLink model compliance as part of its validation process. And KGX is also capable of reading from turtles, uh, Sparkle endpoints, Neo4j instances, TSV or CSVs. So the idea is to make the process of exchanging information between knowledge graph as painless as possible. And not just knowledge graphs, but also serialization formats for these knowledge graphs. And KGX also supports operations like ID remapping and click merging. And these are things that have been extremely helpful when you try to merge two or more KGs together. So we are an open source project, and uh, the model itself lives on GitHub. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the main source of truth is the YAML. So if you have anything you need to add or uh, you need to go through, that would be, the, would be the first place to start. And we do have documentation as well on GitHub pages. And we, do uh, and we appreciate feedback and uh, contributions from the community as GitHub issues and pull requests. And I would now like to thank the members of the NCATS Biomedical Data Translator Consortium, as well as the Monarch Initiative, for their invaluable feedback and contributions, both direct and indirect, uh, and for all of their time in hours of discussion that went into the, in building this model. And the names here represent all the people who have directly been part of the, uh, building this data model. Well, thank you.